Okay, session two, the message and grace. <clears throat> nu, als ik Nederlands begon te spreken, zou het waarschijnlijk niet veel betekenis hebben voor de meeste van jullie. Anybody get that? Okay, well, I speak in Dutch I, or Flemish. I spent 11 years in Belgium. And sometimes when people go out to share the word of God or the gospel, they might as well be speaking a foreign language uh, because they use wording and phrases that maybe we understand as Christians, uh, but they're too religious in nature, especially for uh, today's time when fewer and fewer people have any idea of what the Bible means or certain religious words mean. So I want to go over uh, some key words, four basic key words. This session only two, grace and the gospel. But let's get started. There was uh, <clears throat> a man one time who thought he wanted to be a truck driver. And it was recommended to him by his pastor. And this is a good recommendation. If you think you might want to go into a field and you could tell your children that, uh, this instruction or recommendation, or it'd be good for yourself if you're looking for a job change. He said, you need to go out where these people are working and find out firsthand what the positive and the negative aspects are of the work. So he went to a, a truck stop and decided he would try to meet some of the truck drivers. And he sat down at uh, the counter and sure enough, a truck driver came in and sat down next to him. And the truck driver shouted out, he said, hey Louise, Bring me the standard. I want uh, three flat tires and two headlights. And the man thought, what in the world is this truck driver doing? And sure enough, Louise brought him three pancakes and two eggs sunny side up. They had their own jargon, their own way of, of talking as a, as a truck driver. Same thing is, with, is true with Christians. Sometimes we have our own phraseology that people simply do not understand. We need to learn to be clear. Uh, there was a, a, a report on Fox News, this was a couple of years ago, where the Koreans, the South Koreans, wanted to speak English more properly. They had trouble saying certain, you've heard somebody from Korea and you can pick up on their accent after a while. And a doctor developed a surgery where he could actually slice the side of their tongues off and help them you know, uh, pronounce English words more clearly. Well, I'm not suggesting anything that drastic, but I do want us to think about how can we phrase things? How can we explain things in such a way that an unbeliever cannot misunderstand the gospel? Um, now, I don't know, is there a circle on the workbook with the number 710? Maybe not, but maybe on the, the back of your workbook, draw a big circle um, and put the number 710 in the middle of the circle, okay? And it's a story of a lady one time <clears throat> whose husband uh, went off on a business trip. And uh, so she went and got in the car, <clears throat> started it up, and she heard something rattling. So she got out and opened the hood and started trying to feel for things to find out what was rattling under the hood. And in the process, she knocked this certain part off of the engine and it rolled off and it went down in a French drain and she couldn't get it. And she was real concerned because this was her husband's car and she was afraid, oh, he's gonna be mad. So she goes to an auto, uh, uh, auto parts uh, store <clears throat> and she explains to the, uh, the car drove okay Uh, but she explained to the man behind the, the counter what had happened, and he said, well, give me the make and model, and I'll see if I can find a part with that number on it. She says, all I remember is that it had the number 710, and he looked everywhere in the books that he could, on the computer, couldn't find anything. He said, look, draw me a picture of this part. Maybe I can figure out what it is. So she drew a circle and put the number 710, Of course, he's standing on the other side of the counter. And so what does he read? Oil. oil. She lost the oil cap. <laughs> so again, sometimes when people go out to share the grace of God, they really inadvertently share some kind of works or effort required on the part of the unbeliever to come to faith in Christ. Um, 
Spurgeon said it this way, it's not good enough to be so clear that people understand you, but rather you must be so clear that people cannot misunderstand you. So we try to teach people to bend over backwards to be super clear on the grace of God, what it is to be saved by grace. Um, now with that in mind, I think it's on page five, there's a box, is that right? Write down the essential elements as you understand it for what a person has to believe to be saved. I'll give you 60 seconds. The essential elements of what a person has to believe or believe in to be saved. And no looking around or cheating, I'm watching. Okay, you got 30 seconds left. <clears throat> okay, everybody got it? Now with that in mind, one time a man was feeling interested in spiritual things and decided he would go to church and see if he could figure out what the gospel was. He had heard his friends talking about the gospel one time, and he got up early, so he decided he'd turn on the TV set, and sure enough, a preacher came on, and the preacher was preaching on the gospel. He says, gospel is love. God loves you, and you need to love your neighbor and, and everyone around you because the gospel is love. Well, he thought about that, and he says, well, let me go to church anyway. He got in the car, <clears throat> and sure enough, he turned on the car radio. Another preacher was on, and the preacher said, the gospel is forgiveness. God wants to forgive you, and you need to forgive those around you because the gospel is forgiveness. Well, again, he thought, well, there's another definition. Maybe I better go to church anyway. Maybe the pastor can explain it better. And he goes to church, and the pastor gets up and, and says, you know, the gospel is discipling other people. And by the way, look at this church. We need a, a new paint of coat on it. Uh, we need disciples that are more fervent because that's what the gospel is all about. So he had heard basically three different definitions of the word gospel and left the church more confused than ever. We've discovered that sometimes when people go out to preach the gospel, they're really not clearly preaching the gospel. They're, they're preaching a whole, the whole kitchen sink instead of exactly what a person uh, is expected to do based on the word of God in order to gain entrance into heaven. Now, workbook page six, one thing we must clearly understand is the gospel, the biblical definition. If we don't clearly understand the, the gospel in our own mind, how can we really share the essential elements with an unbeliever? Now, with that in mind, let's look at the one place in the New Testament that uh, really sets forth the fullest picture of the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 5. Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you were saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain." For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter, then to the twelve, etc. <clears throat> now, let's look at three things. First, what is Paul declaring in this passage? Letter A, he's declaring the gospel. He says that in verse 1. <clears throat> uh, letter B, he's pr proclaiming the gospel which he preached to them. Now, the word preached, you don't see it in the English, is the word euangelizomai. The word gospel is euangelion. You see how they're cognate, they're related. It's the verbal word for gospel. Uh, he wants to share the gospel by which he gospelized them. That's not an English word, but that would reveal more clearly the emphasis of this passage. See, 
uh, and also in verse one, it's the gospel they had received. They had accepted it, but they had done more than simply receive it. Um, th- in verse one also, it's, it's the gospel by wh- in which they stood. They had trusted in it. Not just uh, a basic understanding of what the gospel was, but they actually trusted in it. And we'll get into that definition between to accept something as true and to trust in it later on. Letter E, verse 2, it's the gospel by which they were saved. So we're not talking about just any old good news. Uh, That's what the word means, literally, it means good news, but a specific technical use of the word gospel by which they were saved. F, it's it's the gospel which Paul had received. So Paul had received this gospel himself directly. Now, secondly, where did Paul get the gospel? Uh, Galatians chapter 1, verse 12, I did not receive it of men, but I was taught it of God. So he got it directly from God, passed it on to the Corinthians, and of course through us, through the the, uh, writing of the scriptures. Now, workbook page 7, I think, how does Paul define the gospel? Now, first of all, notice that the verse numbers in the text of the Bible tend to obscure the beautiful outline. If you were to diagram this and take the verse numbers out, it becomes much more clear what Paul is saying. You can see more clearly the structure of the outline when you look at the outline in the workbook. Um, Help me find four basic verbs. In verse three, what is the first verb that's used? Christ what for our sins? He died for our sins. Now the word uh, for, he died for our sins, is a Greek word huper, and it means on behalf of, in place of. It's the substitutionary payment. So he died for our sins, meaning he died in our place for our sins. Again, you don't necessarily pick up on that in the English language the way it's translated. Um, I'm reminded of a a forest ranger one time who, uh, actually it's not a true story, but it illustrates a truth. And he went out into a burned down forest and there's all these stumps that are smoking and he's just going out to survey the land. And he noticed a large owl sitting on the ground and it was just fried, baked. The eyelids were gone. It had this goofy, scary look on its face. So he walked over and he kicked it over and underneath flew out three or four little owlets. And it represents how the owl could have easily flown away but the owl died for the sake of her little owlets in their place. She didn't have to die, but she chose to die. Um, 2 Corinthians 5.21 talks about how uh, Christ died, uh, became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him, the substitutionary payment of uh, of his death on the cross for our sins. The deal is he takes our sin and he gives us God's righteousness. I mean, you'd be foolish not to accept that deal, and yet people do all the time. Okay, Christ did not die primarily to show us how to die or how to live. He died primarily to pay for our sins. What phrase follows, not the verb, but what phrase follows Christ died for our sins? According to the scriptures. That's Paul's way of emphasizing what preceded that phrase. The fact that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. So he wants to emphasize Christ died for our sins. So the first essential element of the gospel is the fact that Christ died for our sins. Now, which scripture in the Old Testament, that's all they had at that time, do you think Paul was referring to where it teaches the substitutionary death of of Christ or the Messiah? Yeah, most people think it's Isaiah 53. In fact, there's 12 different references in that basic passage that refer to a substitutionary payment idea of the suffering and the death of Christ for our sins. Now, the next verb, (coughs) verse 4, he was what? He was buried. Now, does it have the phrase according to the scriptures? Not after that 
not after that verb, because it's not an essential element. Um, the, it's the proof that he died. You don't bury somebody unless they're dead. So the fact that he was buried is a proof that he died. It's not an essential element. It doesn't hurt to know it, but it, it's not really an essential element of the gospel in the diagram sentence or structure of this passage. Uh, it's a proof, not a main point. Now the next verb is he arose, okay? Um, after three days, he rose. Now, I, I usually say he rose from the dead, just to clarify it, because that's what Paul means. He doesn't mean he just got out of bed. He means he rose from the dead. So write down, he rose from the dead. This is a perfect passive indicative. It means that he rose and he remains into the future, risen. We don't worship uh, Jesus hanging on the cross which is what the emphasis is of a lot of religions that claim to be Christian. They want to emphasize Christ hanging on the cross. Well, he rose from the dead, and we need to emphasize the resurrection. Now, uh, what Old Testament uh, verse do you think Paul was referring to? This one's a little harder. So, sorry? I couldn't hear you. Uh, it may, yeah, it's in Daniel in a vague reference. Uh, it's quoted, the verse that's quoted most often in the New Testament is Psalm uh, 1610, where it says, you will not abandon me to the grave, nor let your Holy One see decay. Uh, Paul, Luke uses that. I think uh, some of the other writers do. That's the verse. It, it seems a little vague to us, the resurrection wasn't clearly understood or emphasized to the degree that it is in the New Testament. Some of that was to prevent probably Satan from interfering on things. Uh, God did not want Satan to understand. It's kind of like, you know, when you tell the enemy what your strategy is, you give him an advantage. Why would you do that? That always bothered me when military leaders in America would say, okay, we're going to do this, or we're going to leave on this date. Well, that to me was the craziest thing we could ever do. I don't want to get political here, uh, but you just don't tell the enemy what you're going to do. And I think some of that was, was hidden, was vague, uh, was kept from a clear understanding for a purpose in the mind of God. Okay, now what phrase follows the fact that he rose from the dead? According to the scriptures, again, you see the beauty of the outline? He's emphasizing the fact that Christ rose from the dead, okay? So that's your kind of point number B, capital B. Now, the next verb in, in, uh, verb in verse 5 is what? He was seen or appeared. Either one is a legitimate translation. Uh, does the phrase follow according to the scriptures? No. It's simply a proof that he rose from the dead, okay? Now, let's, uh, you know, the, the strongest witness you can have in a court of law is an eyewitness. If, um, let me pick on uh, Joe Krippner as long as I'm here. If I saw Joe Krippner stealing something in a store and he had to go to court and I said, I saw Joe doing that, you know, that would be a damning testimony against Joe except that I'm blind, so it wouldn't really mean anything. So Joe would probably get away with it. But <clears throat> anyway, I, you know, eyewitnesses. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. But there's other people who have eyes, Joe, so, and there's cameras now. So don't you do it. <laughs> so to, to be an eyewitness is a very strong proof of the fact that he was resurrected by more than 500 people. Actually, it goes on to say in that passage. Now, let's do a little bit of review. Uh, what's the first essential element? And what's the proof? He was buried. What's the second essential element? And the proof? Okay. Now let's say it with a little bit more heart. What's the, the first essential element? And the proof? And the second essential? And the proof? Okay, now let's take out the proofs. Let's get it 
right? Let's crystallize it just a bit more. What's the first essential element altogether? And the second essential element? There you go. Those are the two essential elements. And I want to be able to call you up at 2 o'clock in the morning and say, uh, Nancy, what are the two essential elements of the gospel? And I don't want you to go, hello, who's this? I want you... (laughs) I want you to say Christ died for our sins and he rose from the dead. That is the gospel by which we're saved. Uh, Romans (coughs) 1.16. Excuse me. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God unto salvation. When a person accepts and trust in that message. You can't separate the person from the message, uh, the person of Jesus Christ, then uh, that person has eternal life. Okay, let's go back to, uh, what page is that on? Four, the, the, where the, no, the box where you wrote down? Five. five, page five. Go back to page five and see if you wrote down Christ died for our sins and rose from the dead. Now, usually people get something in that area, but it's not really as precise and, and uh, clear as uh, I just taught it or as the scriptures teach it. I've done this enough to know that probably 70, 80% of the people get in the ballpark, but maybe only 10, 20, or 30% get it precisely correct what are the essential elements of the gospel? What are they again? Number one? And number two? Rose from the dead. I think you got it. Okay. Okay, workbook page eight. Uh, you'll see some references of the death and resurrection in the gospels, the first uh, three books in particular, the synoptic gospels. Uh, You'll read it uh, consistently in Paul's writings, also in the book of Acts. I just haven't compiled them and added them all. And I want to close this part right now on grace with this. Napoleon was considered a great military leader. And uh, he would often, you know, mostly stay back from the front lines because he was too valuable. If he got captured or killed, it would be damaging to the war effort. So he would have a messenger to take a message to the front lines. And he always gave the messenger three instructions. He'd give him the message, and then he would say this. Now remember these three instructions. Number one, be clear. Number two, be clear. Number three, be clear. So as we go out to share the gospel, gospel, make sure that you're clear include the two essential elements of the gospel. Now, workbook page nine, a second important concept is the, the, the word, uh, the gospel, or rather, um, grace. Sorry, getting lost here. Acts 20, 24, Paul talks how he had the task of testifying to the grace of God's gospel. If you're not preaching or sharing the gospel of grace, you're not really preaching the gospel. Uh, Galatians chapter 1, 6, and 7, he equates the the grace of Christ to the gospel of Christ and gives a very stern warning that if you're not preaching the gospel as he preached it, then you're falling under a curse. You're falling under anathema. Actually, the word, I think, refers to uh, you need to be put outside the church. But that's uh, for another time. I don't have time to go into that. So if if it's not the gospel of grace, it's not the gospel of Christ. Uh, Number two, we should clarify what grace is. Uh, Many unbelievers don't understand that word grace. Um, You know, maybe they've seen on TV where people uh, pray before they eat and they say grace. They thank God for the food. Well, that's not, it kind of has the idea of grace, but that's, it doesn't really define what it is uh, in the mind of the unbeliever. I was uh, building custom homes with a friend of mine back in the early 80s, and we were the only uh, custom home builder 
selling homes at that time. It was a pr pretty hard time. Interest rates were at 17 and 7 eighths percent. Can you imagine that? And we were selling homes. And uh, a, uh, a journalist in the newspaper wanted to come by and interview us. And she came by and asked what our secret was. How were we able to sell and continue to build and sell homes? And we answered, well, it's grace. And she turned to her uh, other journalist that had been there with her, and she said, Grace, is, is that some realtor's name? She, she didn't understand that we were talking about it's by God's grace that we're able to do that. Uh, and religious unbelievers have a distorted view of what gr grace is. Uh, many religions teach that you're saved by grace, but they redefine it as a type of works. Um, I remember, well, let me skip that one, I don't have time. Uh, the, Spurgeon said it this way, the greatest enemy to human souls is the self-righteous spirit which makes men look to themselves for salvation. If you're not teaching pure grace, if it's not clear to the unbeliever, and again, they're addicted to works, you're not really making the gospel clear like you should. Now. I'll give you an example. You've got five circles? Okay. I shared this with uh, Nora in Latvia. Let me kind of arrow down here a little bit. Okay. <clears throat> and she had trouble understanding grace. And uh, so I, I, in the first circle, I wrote down the word, or uh, the letter W. So write down the letter W in the first circle, top left. And then the middle circle, on, on the top line, write down W plus G. And then in the third circle, on the first line, write down the letter G. I said, now W stands for works. The middle circle, W plus G, stands for works plus grace. And then the third circle represents grace. I said, which of these three circles represents the basis, the way a person gets to heaven? Is it by works? Is it by works plus grace, or is it by grace? Now, which circle do you think she picked? She picked the middle one. Even though I had emphasized over and over again that salvation is the gift of God, not by works. It, people want to cover their bases. They want to be safe. So they want to say it's by both. And uh, I try to be positive, so I said, well, you know, it's not the first one. Romans 4, 5 says, but to him who works not, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited to him as righteousness. So you're right, it's not the first one. But uh, in fact, and so I said, right underneath that one, no gift. So right underneath that one, no gift, Romans 4, 5. And then the middle circle, I said, but it's also not the middle circle. Because Romans eleven six 6 says, that if it's by grace, then it's not by works, otherwise grace is no more grace. And so write down underneath that one, false gift. It's a false gift if you have to add works to it of any kind. And uh, the only possible answer then is grace. Write down Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works so that no one may boast. And write down free gift emphasize the word free. Now, just to give you an idea of where the unbeliever's mind often is, <clears throat> she said, well, you need another circle. So you see the two circles underneath? On the left circle, write down this. She said, I, she took my pen. I could barely see, I had a big marker. And she said, you need another circle. So she drew a circle. She said, it's not W plus G, but it's G plus W. She reversed it. And I said, well, let me ask you this. Does it matter if you mix muddy water with clean water or clean water with muddy water? What do you end up with? She said, well, you end up with muddy water. I said, yeah, it doesn't matter. So that's not the answer. And she said, well, I think you need another circle yet. I said, <laughs> I said okay, well, what, what do you mean? And she took in the, the last circle, write down these letters. She wrote down a great big G plus a little bitty W. She wanted to get works into the gospel in the worst way. This is where the minds of many unbelievers are, uh, addicted to some kind, even a small amount of works for salvation. Um, she still struggled with it until I wrote this down. I said, works 
does not equal, I put a does not equal sign, heaven, works equals thank you to God. And it was like a little light went off in her voice. I couldn't really see her very well. And she goes, oh, I thought you were against good works. I said, heavens, no, I'm not against good works. You just can't work your way to heaven. That's all that I'm trying to make clear. And she trusted the Lord. And she brought her boyfriend by the next day, and we led him to the Lord. Okay, so she could see how works fit into the whole picture. And that's sometimes very helpful. You'll see this uh, also replicated in the gift cube, which we'll go over at another time. Now, workbook page 10, we can define grace with two parts. One, it's a free gift from God. Two, given directly to those who trust in Christ, okay? Or trust in the gospel, same thing. Now, Paul emphasizes um, 10 times in Romans, well, actually, let me back up. He emphasizes the freeness of, of God's grace throughout the book of Romans, but in particular, um, Romans 3.24, he talks about how we are justified freely by his grace. Well, it's, if it's by grace, it's freely. Why does he add that? Because he wants to emphasize the free gift of salvation. Uh, Romans 4.5, we've already mentioned it. That, but, but to him who does not work, his faith is credited to him as righteousness. Um, Romans 5, 15 through 21, I won't take time to read it for time's sake, but he mentions 10 times in this passage either the word gift or grace. He's really emphasizing the fact that we're saved by grace. Now, what kind of question or objection will that naturally bring into the mind of a person? Think about that. I have this kind of question come up all the time because I emphasize strongly the free gift, the grace that God wants to save us by. The natural question we see in Romans chapter 6, verse 1, the very next verse. Again, sometimes the, the verse and chapter numbers obscure the flow of what Paul is saying. He's emphasizing 10 times, you're saved by grace, it's a gift. Now he's saying, okay, what kind of things maybe has he heard? Yeah, shall I just continue in sin? And then it makes God look even more gracious and more magnanimous. Look at all, oh, let's sin all the more. And of course, Paul's answer is, that's not why I'm telling you this. No, meganoito, may it never be in the Greek. Um, also in, in verse 15, he says, if we're not under the law, we're not under the law. Shall we go on sinning? Again, meganoito. I'm not saying that. I'm not teaching antinomianism, that the law is not important or the law is not just or holy. Uh, now, if you get those kind of objections, those kind of questions, then you can be assured that you're preaching the same gospel that Paul preached. If you get the kind of question that Paul, a rhetorical question perhaps, could have been a real question that he had heard, then you can be assured that you're preaching the gospel of grace. If you're not getting that kind of question, it may be an indication that you're really not making the gospel clear. Now, this is how I hear the question today in, in modern vernacular. They'll say, are you telling me I can just trust in Christ and then just live any way I want to? I used to hate that question because I didn't know how to answer it for years. I, I just said, well, no, I'm not saying that, but I was con it was a confusing kind of uh, response. But now I, I'm really hoping they ask me that question because I've learned how to answer it. How do you respond? Um, first of all, compliment the question because it means they understand, they're thinking, they understand what you're saying. So say, you know, that is a great question. And I used to wrestle with that. Um, second, explain that you cannot answer every question uh, with a yes or no answer, okay? For example, if I asked uh, Nancy if she's still beating up Dave. <laughs> now, it, if she says no, well, then she admits that she used to. That's, now, maybe she did. I don't know. Uh, 
uh, I asked that one time in a, uh, a seminar that I taught in Ukraine. I asked his pastor, I said, if you sit, now, Pastor uh, Vasily, if I ask you, are you still beating up your wife? What would you say? And he said, well, I don't, I don't not anymore. I used to. And he kind of ruined my illustration. <laughs> so anyway, you can't always, if, you, if uh, Nancy said, yes, I'm still beating up Dave, well, then that's a problem. We need to talk. So you can't answer every question with a yes or no. In fact, it's a dual question. So what I do, I break or separate out to two real questions. I say, yeah, am I saying salvation is an absolute free gift? Yes. Secondly, am I therefore encouraging you to sin even more? And the answer to that is absolutely not. Uh, now, workbook page 11, um, I have a number of illustrations I use, depending on my target audience. Um, for example, if it's a, a blue collar worker, I'll use what I call the ditch digger illustration. And that's where a man's out digging a ditch seven days a week, hot, sweaty, miserable work, and a Rolls Royce drives up. A man gets out and says, are you so-and-so? He says, well, yes, I am. He said, come with me. So you, he gets in the Rolls Royce. They drive up to this beautiful palace. Uh, he's ushered up into a bathroom and given a beautiful you know, shower and uh, all kinds of ointments, wonderful clothes. He comes back down and he meets the king. And the king says, you're my lost son. I'm so thankful that we found you. And so that evening they have a delicious banquet and celebrate, wonderful time. And then the king says, you know, you go on to bed and I'll explain uh, things more in the morning. So the man goes to bed, a luxurious bed, pillows, soft cushions, everything. He wakes up in the morning. Now, let me ask you, does he put on his old dirty clothes again or his princely uh, robes? Well, of course, he's going to put on his princely. Why would he go back and dig ditches? In the same way, once a person is trusted in Christ, they need to understand they have a new identity. They're a son of the king. Uh, so why would they want to you know, roll around in the dirt again? They, they should be motivated, instilled to want to say thank you to God. Now, if it's a white-collar worker, somebody that's pretty wealthy, I use a BMW illustration, and I tell them, you know, what kind of BMW would you like to have? Now, sometimes I'll say, well, I already got one. I said, well, let's think of something better, <laughs> a Ferrari or something that maybe you don't have. And I say, explain to me what color you'd want, what features you'd want on it. And I get them to explain some of that. And then I said, well, suppose I bought you one as a free gift. You signed off on it. It's yours legally. Taxes are paid. Insurance paid. Inspect I paid for everything. Now, could you legally take a hatchet and break out the headlights and the windshield and tear up the leather seats and break out the, the, the moon window or whatever it may Could you legally do that? And he'll say, well, yeah, I guess legally I could. I said, but would you do that? He'd say, no, no, that's far, it's far too valuable of a, of a car. I'd want to take care of it. I said, well, you know, in the same way, your salvation is the most valuable thing that you can possess because it costs God the blood of his only son. And so you should do everything you can, you know, to protect your testimony to live a life that shows God that you're thankful for what God has given you as a free gift through faith in Christ alone. Um, now, if it's a, a really educated person, maybe it's a doctor, I'll tell them the story about how a man had a, a crippling disease and it was terminal and um, there was no cure for it until a doctor found uh, some kind of remedy. And it's very expensive treatment and he agreed to treat you for free, okay? And <clears throat> he comes and he meets you, he treats you, you're healed. And then maybe three months later after you've recovered, he calls you up and says, uh, hey, Ralph. He says, uh, I've, I need to move a piano in my room and it's too heavy for me to do. Do you think you could possibly come help me? Now, what are you gonna say? Are you gonna hang up on the doctor and say, huh, 
who does that doctor think he is asking me to come over and do some kind of menial job? No, you, you would be glad. You would, you'd want to show him your gratefulness. Now, would you, would you have to? No, you wouldn't have to. But it wouldn't be a very kind thing, a very kind way to treat that doctor. Uh, there's the alligator one. I use this one with teenagers quite often uh, simply because they don't know what manual labor is and they don't have any money. And they don't tend to be, well, I shouldn't say they shouldn't be. <laughs> Do we have teenagers here? Oh, okay. Never mind. I didn't say any of that. <clears throat> but the teenagers seem to like this one. There was a father and son on the shore of a, of a river, or no, a lake. <clears throat> and uh, they were fishing, but they weren't catching anything. And so the father told his son, he said, look, I'm going to go sit down and rest under the shade tree. And you can fish but I'll probably fall asleep. And I don't want you getting in the boat out there and going into the middle of the lake. Because if you go to the middle of the lake, there's a nasty alligator out there and he could hurt you. And so the man goes and sits down, the father does, and he falls asleep. And what does the son do? He gets in the boat, goes out to the middle of the lake. He's standing up fishing. That alligator sees him, bumps the boat, knocks him out of the boat. And the boy starts screaming, Dad, help, help, the alligator's coming. He wakes up his father. His father dives into the lake, swims between the boy and the alligator. He's pushing his boy ahead of him, and at the same time, he's kicking at that alligator. And finally, they escape by the help of his father. And they're, they're lying there on the shore together, and the, the son, he looks down at his father, and he sees that his dad is missing one foot and his other leg is just a mangled piece of flesh. Now, if you were that boy, would you say to your father, hey, dad, that was fun. Let's go do that again. I don't think so. I think you would be deeply grateful for what your father had done. And in the same way, we need to be deeply grateful for the grace of God. Uh, sometimes people will say, well, I'm just going to trust in Christ and live like I want to. And Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6 addresses that point. <clears throat> it says, because the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. So you can try to live like you want to, but God is a good father and he will discipline you. <coughs> and another one that I use sometimes is the difference between a caterpillar and a butterfly. Um, once a, a, a caterpillar becomes a butterfly, uh, it doesn't have to crawl around in the dirt. Why would it? It can fly. And in the same way, we need to fly in heavenly realms and understand our identity, that we don't have to crawl around in the dirt. That's not what we were created for. We were created, you know, to serve him and to love him. It's not serving and loving him that saves us. That's what gives us the, the potential, the ability through the power of the Holy Spirit to, to learn by God's grace, Titus 2, verse 11, that it's by God's grace that he teaches us to say no to ungodliness, not to be mean, not to take things away from us, but to help us to have a life of meaning and joy here on earth. Okay, so let's define grace one more time. One, it's a free gift from God. Two, given directly to those who trust in Christ. Okay, a couple of thought-provoking statements before we leave here. Good people don't go to heaven. It's forgiven people that go to heaven. And it's not our good things that get us to heaven. It's our bad things that can keep us out if they're not forgiven. Okay? Okay, let's see. Okay, I'm going to have to stop there. What time is it now?